are the opportunity that many of us have this week to enjoy being with family. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for Thanksgiving, and we thank you for our nation, and we thank you for those that protect our nation, and we thank you for those that lead our nation. And while we may not always agree with those who lead our nation, we thank you that you have allowed us to be in such a wonderful nation. Lord, we pray that this morning you would speak to our hearts, you would speak to our minds, you would speak to our souls, and help us to see what it is that you, how we should respond to the message that we're about to hear. For your honor and for your glory. For it's in Christ's name we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. Two out of five. <laughs> Roughly 40% of the American population will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lives. There are four people in my immediate family, my wife, and my sons, myself. So far, our rate is one out of two. You put in my mom and my dad, and we're uh, four out of six. This means what? In all likelihood, you are directly related to, and you will know someone who will be diagnosed with cancer if they haven't already. Could be you. I was the first one in my family that was diagnosed with cancer but I was not the last. Cancer is certainly a terrible disease in our day. Can we agree with that? It's a terrible disease. There was a different disease, however, in Jesus' day that many people feared and that families despised and it impacted in terrible ways. And I want to ask you, if you would, turn with me your copy of God's Word to Luke chapter 17, and we're starting in verse 11. This morning. <coughs> Luke 17, 11. That disease in Jesus' day was called leprosy. It was terrible. It was horrible. Today we're going to look at 10 people that were afflicted by it. Luke 17, 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers who stood far off. Verse 13, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourself to the priest. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God, and fell down at his, on his face at his feet, <coughs> giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Verse 17, So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Where were not any others found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Verse 19. And he said to him, Arise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. One out of ten. <clears throat> Hardly conclusive, right? I mean, if you, if you were watching football yesterday, and I imagine that some of you were. And you saw an advertisement for, say, uh, I don't know, toothpaste, Mr. Wayne. By the way, if you, think you had too many cups of coffee this morning, you go to Wayne after service and he'll look you up with some toothpaste. <laughs> you see a, an ad for toothpaste and it says, one out of ten dentists agree that this is the best toothpaste ever. Does that make you want to rush right out to Piggly Wiggly or Walmart to buy some? No, because it's probably sold at Harbor Freight, right? I mean, you know. <laughs> On the other hand, if a prescription were coming, y'all ever watch the commercial and they're talking about, you know, you try this prescription. And of course, the, the, it sounds like they're speaking Klingon or some other name or uh, language, right? And it says uh, the, the side effects could be blah, 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 blah. blah. I mean, they go on for like five minutes, all the different side effects. But if it said there was a one in 10 chance in having a side effect, well, that means there's a 9% chance there's no side effect. That'd be pretty good. I like that. How about you? But here in our passage this morning, the result is 1 out of 10. And I think 1 out of 10 are thankful. That would be more like the toothpaste and less like the prescription, right? I mean, imagine you had 10 kids. Now, some of you may have had 10 kids. I don't know. I can't imagine having more than two that I had. They feel like 10 or 12 sometimes. Come on. Can I get an amen? amen. Not my kids. Your kids. I know. Uh, or maybe 10 grandchildren. Or maybe just 10 kids from a local school. And he did something for them, and only one of the kids said thank you. Does 
that just make you want to drop everything and do some more for them? I wouldn't think so. Let's look again at our passage this morning. Let's see if we can uncover some clues as to why this one had gratitude and the others did not. And then let's see if we can learn something that will help us. So Luke chapter 17, verse 11 through 13. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood far off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Ten men. Ten men living in the outskirts between two major areas, right? Between Samaria and Galilee. Kind of like Acre between <laughs> Sylvester and Albany. Maybe a little bit, right? Or Scooterville between Sylvester and Norman Park. Norman Park's a major area, right? <laughs> maybe something. Anyway... So, but we're not called the name of the village. Maybe they don't know. Maybe they didn't have one. Perhaps Luke was embarrassed to say that Jesus walked through this particular place. Doesn't matter, though, so much as the people. Remember what? Ten men with the same problem. Leprosy. Leprosy is a cruel disease, if you don't know anything about it, especially in biblical times. It may have been one name for many different skin ailments. In fact, it would not surprise me at all if some people had melanoma, which we, we, we would know today as melanoma, were in fact diagnosed with leprosy back then. But you see, leprosy is contagious, and they would be cast out from their families, and maybe they had melanoma, and because they were cast out from their families and had to go and live with other lepers, they actually contracted it. I don't know. That just seems like a very plausible thing. But... Leprosy causes the area in the skin that are affected to shrivel up and die. Typically, it starts with the extremities, the fingers, the toes, the ears, the nose. And as you can imagine, it was a scary disease. Can you imagine parts of your body just shriveling up and dying? It seems terrible. And I'm sure over time it had to be very difficult. Like I said, leprosy is a communicable disease and would be transferred from one person to another. And so as a precaution, once you were diagnosed, you had to get away from everybody else. Y'all remember the first round of COVID? Kind of like that. <coughs> or think about those who've been quarantined because they were treated with radiation or some other dangerous treatment. Hopefully they do so will willingly and they stay away from others. <coughs> those with leprosy in Jesus' day, would, if they were to go out in public, they would have to cry out, Unclean! Unclean! To let everybody know they were sick. Because of this, lepers were outcasts and they were lonely, and so they would live in these colonies by themselves, each destined to die a slow death. This life, like their impending death, was far from normal. Their dreams, their family, their health, everything that they'd ever trusted in was slipping through their hands like grains of sand. Is it any wonder then that these men would seek out Jesus? He was their hope. If anybody could help, he could. Is it any different than today? People are diagnosed with a terrible disease. Their doctor says it's cancer. And in those moments, many will cry out and say, why me? And others will cry out to Jesus for help. And for him. Surely by now, news had spread far and wide about this man, this amazing man who could give the sight to the blind, who, who could make the lame walk, who could cause the deaf to hear, and even give a leper new flesh, healthy flesh. Just imagine their surprise when far off in the distance they saw someone with a crowd of people around him. Could it be? Could it be this Jesus? He wouldn't be walking through Samaria, would he? And sure enough, as he gets a little closer, then and they realize it was him. And so on the one hand, they're trying to be respectful and keep their distance. On the other hand, they're desperate for him to do what? To heal them. And so they cry out. They stand far off and they cry out and they lift up their voices and they say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. All ten of them recognized that they, were, they had a physical need. It was, after all, hard to ignore, even if you tried. Something 
or someone was always there to remind you. So they all cried out to Jesus because all ten had the same predicament. So the one who returns condition was not what made him different. Something different about this guy, but it wasn't that. Perhaps then it was Jesus' response. Let's look at verse 14. So when he, Jesus, saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was, as they went, they were cleansed. Was there something that Jesus said differently to this one that returned as opposed to the others? Did Jesus hold this one back for a moment and say something special to him? Anything like that? No, we don't, we don't read that at all in the text. He told them all exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. Now you may wonder, why would Jesus tell them to go show themselves to the priest? That seems like an odd thing to do, doesn't it? But in Leviticus chapter 13, we discover that the power of diagnosis for leprosy was in the hands of the priest. They could tell people whether or not they had leprosy, and they could also declare someone as clean. It was, they were the final word. And so in order for these ten men to be able to go back to their homes, back to their lives, back to their families, they had to get a clean bill of health from the priest. But obviously the difference was not Jesus' response, nor was it a different condition. All that was equal. Then what made this one come back? I believe the answer lies in starting in verse 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned <clears throat> and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. I believe this is the reason he came back. And it had nothing to do with the disease and everything to do with Christ. This one came back because he recognized that Jesus was under no obligation to help him. Notice what Jesus says in verses 17, 18, and 19. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Were there not any found to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. The implication is this, the other nine were Jews. Just like Jesus. The other nine had a similar lineage to Jesus. They all had Abraham as their great, 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 great grandfather and Sarah as their great, 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 great grandfather. They worshipped in the same place. They had a common history. The Samaritans did not share that with the Jews. They were, and this is the way the Bible describes them, they were half Jews. They were half Jewish, half Assyrian. They were outcasts. Before this man ever got leprosy, he would have been treated as an outcast by Jewish people, especially by the priests. In fact, probably the only reason the other nine dared to even associate with this one was because of the disease. Funny how sickness is a way of leveling the flame before it feels, doesn't it? Leprosy, like cancer, doesn't care who you are. You not care about your race, your creed, or your relatives. You can be a pastor and get cancer. I was. You can be a, the town drunk and get cancer. You can have millions of dollars. You can have millions of fleas. It doesn't matter. It doesn't care. Neither does leprosy. This man recognized that Jesus would have been well within his right to say to the nine Jewish men, hey, you're my brothers and you're healed. And look at the Samaritan and say, I cannot help you. You're not one of my people. But does he do that? No. All these men had the same debilitating disease. All these men were in the same exact boat that was not headed in the right direction. In fact, it was heading over a waterfall of pain, worry, and disease. But Jesus makes a choice, a choice not to single out someone simply because he was the wrong race, to not see nine Jews and one Samaritan, but to see ten lepers, ten men with leprosy. Ten men he could heal, and in response to Jesus' grace, this one man, the one who knew that he didn't deserve it more than anybody else, returns with praise on his lips. Verse 15, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God. He didn't want to hide it. He wanted everybody to know. 
And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And when this Samaritan does this, he not only gets healed, healed physically, he gets healed spiritually. Notice how Jesus responds specifically to him in verse 19. And he said to him, <clears throat> Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. How is it possible? It's not likely this guy worshipped like the other nine. He might be familiar with the tenets of the Jewish faith. He probably was not somebody who grew up going to the synagogue like they did, who practiced like they did. Why should he? In all likelihood, he grew up up to the point that he got leprosy. There wasn't a Jew that would give him the time of death. <clears throat> Yet this guy got it. He figured it out. His need, like our need, was not merely physical. It was his soul, too. It wasn't just the skin, it was the soul that needed healing. And because he was grateful for what the Lord had done, his healing was complete. The other nine, they got healed physically. This one got healed physically and spiritually. This past week, many of us gathered together for a big meal. I don't know about you, but man, mine, I mean, it, was just, it was huge. Thanksgiving. I don't know what your traditions are, but I like it when we the festivities we share some things we're thankful for. Right? Regardless of what life has thrown at you this year or in recent years, we've all got things to be thankful for. First, we're blessed to be born into or live in a nation that uh, is the greatest on the planet. We're blessed. We're blessed. Last year at Thanksgiving, I called a customer service line. By the way, I hate calling customer service line. And I was talking with somebody that wasn't in our country. Can you imagine that? <laughs> she was from the Philippines. And it was Thanksgiving, and she said, uh, can you explain Thanksgiving to me? Right? And so I'm thinking back in my mind, okay, so the pilgrims come over from Europe. They have a really hard winter. The people who are already in the United States, before the United States, help them to hunt and farm and this, that, and the other, and the conditions that they had. And when they had a big crop at the end of the year, and they survived, they got together, and they had a big feast, and they thanked God. Right? They celebrated. So we do, in remembrance of that, take time to be thankful for what God has done. Maybe you have a tradition in your family about taking a moment to share what you're thankful for around the table. May I suggest you continue to share things that you're thankful for each day of the year? I mean, surely if we think hard enough, we can come up with 365 blessings the Lord has given us each year. Second, we're blessed to have the Lord as our Savior. Now, I mention this only second because we have no choice in what we're born. But we do make the decision to accept the free gift of God to be born again. Jesus could have only come to the Jews, and that could have been his prerogative, and that would have been his right. He could have only healed the Jews in the story and in history, but he didn't. He came to save anybody who would trust in him, anyone in the whole wide world, to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile. That's me. That's you. And so this morning, can we take time to be grateful that he did not withhold his offer of salvation from us simply because of where we were born or who our parents were? Third, and this kind of goes with the second, yet it is helpful to remember this morning and every morning that we are blessed that Jesus took upon himself our sins, that we might become children of God. <laughs> like all of us, that Samaritan needed to be physically healed. In fact, that is, I mean, no, spiritually healed. That is our greatest need in the world. The greatest need in the world is not poverty, and it's not hunger, and it's not COVID, and it's not AIDS, and it's not global warming or any of those things. The greatest need in the world is salvation from sin. Because it's the one thing that afflicts everyone. Many of us desire to be physically healed as well. For some of us, prayers will go up and either instantly or with treatment, healing will come. Some of us will have to wait until eternity to be physically healed. But none of us have to wait one more moment to be spiritually healed. None of us. Why? You can trust Christ as your Savior today, right now, right here, 
You don't need to wait for another minute because you don't know what the next few moments will hold. I read, I got an alert on my phone over Thanksgiving that people had died in Moultrie in a car accident. I'm sure they weren't planning on going to their demise that day. What about what happened up in New York State? I'm sure nobody expected that, what happened up there. You don't know what the next few moments will hold. And when you do, you, when you bow your heart and faith to Jesus and take him upon him, he takes upon himself the worst ailment you will ever have, your failures, your disappointment, your sins and transgressions. You'll be healed. And like the leper, you will say to Jesus this morning, and he will say to you, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Friends, I don't know if you've had the experience. I hope you haven't. But I have. I remember sitting in my doctor's office after having a biopsy of a big old stinking needle. It felt like it was that long. It probably wasn't. It was probably correct. It was probably about that long. But it felt like it was that long. In my neck. And about a week later, the doctor called me into his office and he said, Well, first of all, you need to know it's cancer. And then everything else he said after that sounded like Charlie Brown's teeth. That's all I heard. Now, thank the Lord, my wife was there and she was writing stuff down because I had, I mean, that was. Once that C word hits, it's like a nuclear bomb that goes off in a room. And if you've ever, if you if you've gone through this, you know what I mean. And listen, the Lord and I had some real conversations. I was pastoring the church at the time, and I, I mean, I, I went to the Lord and I said, God, I'm your servant, I'm your child, I'm your pastor. Why are you letting this happen to me? It's because of a sin eating world that any of us have. And I told the Lord, I said, Lord, if you'll just let this not be true, if you'll heal me from this, I'll tell everybody I know. I'll tell everybody I ever meet. If you'll just let this not be true. But he refused to do that. And so I walked through that process. To this day, I still have to take medicine each and every day in order to keep up my thyroid function. Because I don't know if you know this or not, but thyroids are kind of important. I mean, they're not brain kind of important, but they're pretty important. And I was not happy with God for a while. And he let me be not happy with God. There wasn't an army with me. There wasn't. And so this morning I have this question for you. Do you have you placed your faith in Christ? Have you come to that place like that leper where you have nowhere else to turn with this man? And then when you realize what he had done in your life, you turn to him and say, Did that happen? If it hasn't happened today, I want to let you know it can. And I'm not mad at you. God's not mad at you. That he loves you so much that he died for you. And he didn't have to do it, but he chose to do it anyway. That's you this morning. I would love the opportunity to talk with you and help you understand what that means. Maybe you've been worshiping in Isabella for a while. You know this is what God's called you to serve. And you want to join Isabella. We'd love to have the opportunity to talk with you about it. You said, well, Isabella doesn't have a pastor right now. He doesn't listen. Church membership has nothing to do with pastors. I want you to hear that loud and clear. Church membership has nothing to do with pastors. It has everything to do with Jesus. 
And if he's calling you to be a member of Isabella Baptist Church today, he's not going to change his mind the next guy shows up. That's just the way it is. Or maybe this morning you just want to come and pray at this altar about something. I mean, you probably were just around family for a really extended period of time, and man, some of you are glad they're gone. <laughs> and I can tell by your nervous laughter that I'm not alone. <laughs> Of course, the ones that left aren't the ones I wanted to leave. That's a different. That's a different. You're kidding. It's not good. Maybe that's you this morning. You seem to come pray about something. Maybe that's that's something. You, know, you want to pray for a family member or a friend or something that's going through a hard time right now. You do that. Maybe God's calling you out. God's still calling people in the ministry. God's still calling you, and it's not just kids, and it's not just teenagers, and it's not just young people. It's it's middle-aged adults and median adults and even senior adults to go and do ministry. And does that mean you need to go to seminary and learn Greek and Hebrew? Maybe not. Maybe so. I don't know. But if that's something that you want to talk about, you want me to talk about with you, I'd be more than happy to do that. The instrument's going to come. Mr. Jesus is going to come. We're going to have a time, time of invitation. It's, it's a song we sing. It's time for you to respond. And the Lord's leading your heart, leading your mind, leading your soul to respond in some way. I want to encourage you to do that. Maybe this morning. <clears throat> and if not, I want to encourage you to pray for those around you. You certainly can pray for your church. I hope you are already. Nothing wrong with doing that now. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for those who are here today. Thank you for your word. I thank you for that one lone Samaritan leper that showed us that we should be grateful. It reminded us that we should be grateful. Grateful for all you do. Lord, you didn't have to do any of that. But you did you didn't have to die on the cross for our sins, but you did. You didn't have to make it so that we could spend eternity in heaven with you, but you did. You could have looked at us in our lost estate and said, well, it's not my fault. And you chose to intervene. Lord, may we be grateful. Grateful for all you do for us. And even, Lord, be thankful for the things that we didn't particularly care for. Because sometimes those things turn into testimonies. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. May you glorify yourself in these moments as we respond to you. In Jesus' name, we humbly